the Spanish Armada, one of England's most celebrated victories alongside Agincourt. It's entrenched in national pride and comes with its own cultural mythos. However, this is not about the Spanish Armada. History does not end in 1588. This is the story of the Counter Armada, the follow-up to one of England's greatest victories, followed by one of its greatest disasters. It was 1589, and still high of its victory from the previous year, the Elizabethan court wanted to deal another blow to Spain. But despite the Spanish navy being in disarray after the Armada, it was still a European superpower, and if England wanted to get anywhere in this war, they were going to have to bring on allies. Portugal was the natural choice. Following the death of King Sebastian in 1578, a succession crisis took place. The free claimants to the Portuguese throne were all grandchildren of Manuel I, one of them being none other than Philip II, King of Spain, who of course didn't skip a beat at the chance to rule the neighbouring kingdom. His cousin Catalina of Braganza also had a claim to the throne, and although her campaign would ultimately fail, her grandson did become king in 1640. A bigger problem for Philip was his other cousin, Antonio the Prior of Crato. Some proclaimed Antonio king in 1580, although the legality of this is disputed by historians. Meanwhile, Philip wasn't about to let Portugal slip through his fingers and invited many members of the council to come to Spain to stay with him and safely proclaim him king away from any rebels. And just to seal the deal, Philip sent Spanish soldiers to Lisbon to seize the city, and thus they accepted him as their king, not that they had much choice in the matter. Meanwhile, Antonio had no choice but to flee to France, with only the crown jewels of Portugal to keep him financially stable. However, fearful that Philip would send assassins, soon he fled to England, where he was taken under the care of Elizabeth. Now, what better way is there to legitimise your campaign of invading country than bringing with you a disgraced prince with a claim to the throne? With Antonio on their side, they could potentially have a Portuguese ally. The aims of the invasion were ambitious, to say the least. First of all, they wanted to travel to the northern coast of Spain, where they would take out the remainder of the Spanish Atlantic fleet, which was still recuperating from the Armada in the previous year. The second stage of the plan would be an invasion of Lisbon, in which they hoped to spark a revolution against Philip II and place Antonio as the rightful monarch of Portugal. By doing this, they wanted to establish an English base within Portugal to look after English foreign affairs on the continent and thus further antagonise Spain. In addition to this, the English hoped to stay long enough in order to seize a returning Spanish treasure fleet from the New World. The leadership of the mission would be a no-brainer of the Elizabethan court. Sir Francis Drake, the hero of the Armada, would be commanding alongside Sir John Norris, an experienced, well-respected soldier who would lead the land assault in Portugal. But it didn't take long for trouble to start brewing. The Dutch had agreed to contribute to this mission in return for a share of the profits. However, the Dutch warships failed to arrive on time, although 65 ships did. They were also delayed in leaving due to mercenaries from Germany and the Low Countries taking weeks longer than planned. This resulted in English soldiers being stuck in Plymouth waiting, breaking into ships for supplies to feed themselves. Finally, when the mercenaries arrived, they set sail, with 23,000 men and 150 ships. But because of the late start, the command took a risk and abandoned their plan to attack Santander, where the main bulk of the Spanish Atlantic fleet were resting, and instead they headed to Corona. The main reason to land in Corona was to restock the ships. Thanks to the extended stay in Plymouth, many of the supplies had been dwindling far faster than planned. However, this was yet another mistake. Having landed on the 4th of May, the inexperienced English soldiers were out of control. They sacked the city, occupying it for two weeks. When the English heard that the Spaniards were on their way, they fled the town, sailing in less than ideal conditions. However, in total, the costs of Corona far outweighed the gains. 1,500 men were killed. Four generals were killed, and three ships were lost. All this time the English were adrift, with illness beginning to affect the crew. They hadn't even taken enough supplies from Corona in order to last them the journey. 
Plans changed again as they moved to what would have been the final stage of the invasion. They met the Earl of Essex, Robert Devereux, who was likely incredibly frustrated with the efforts of Drake and Norris. Devereux was not supposed to be there. Elizabeth had specifically told him not to join. However, in pursuit of glory, he charged in. After all, how could Elizabeth stay mad if he won such a victory? Unfortunately, he arrived to a shambles, adding even more bulk to this rapidly boiling over pot. Upon arriving in Pineche, Portugal, the English forces were welcomed warmly by Antonio's supporters. However, their patience wore thin when the troops' requirements of food and supplies were greater than expected. The forces split into two parts. Devereux and Norris would march the long and hostile trail to Lisbon, while Drake sailed by way of the River Tangus. Those marching were the soldiers and the mercenaries who would begin the land assault in Lisbon. However, the march proved difficult. With virtually no food or water, many men died en route from starvation, dehydration or exhaustion. Arriving in Lisbon provided little salvation. Supporters of Antonio failed to join them, and the city was so heavily fortified that challenging the Spanish and the local garrisons was nearly impossible. One source mentions Devereux thrusting his sword at the gates of the city, only to be laughed at. Devereux, who at this point was probably greatly regretting his choice, could surely rely on Drake to pick up the slack. Unfortunately not. Drake had one flaw, one that the Spaniards knew all too well. Piracy. So rather than joining his fellow commanders in Lisbon, he gave in to his vice. While the Lisbon assault was crumbling around them, Drake was looting treasure ships. Without Drake anywhere in sight, Norris and Devereux continued to hold ground in the city. There were a number of skirmishes between them and the Iberian forces, mainly with the Iberians attacking the English camp during the night. Eventually, Norris had to concede. They set fire to the camp to provide a distraction and marched the final 20 miles to meet Drake, dragging their terribly bruised egos behind them. Ultimately, the mission was a disaster. The losses were dramatic. Only 100 ships returned, with an estimated 5,000 survivors, putting the death toll at 20,000. It greatly damaged the reputations of its leaders. Drake actually didn't receive any more royal commissions until 1595, quite possibly due to his actions. The only real gain from this mission was £30,000 in plunder from enemy ships. However, when the mission cost over £100,000 itself, this is little consolation. It's no wonder that English history chooses to regret this saga. Coming off the glorious victory of the Spanish Armada, the English were utterly ashamed on an international level by this defeat. Although the Anglo-Spanish Wars would continue for another six years, both sides took time to recuperate, rebuilding their navy and strengthening their military in order to stand a chance against each other again. What we can take away from this story is how nations can create a national mythos by celebrating their victories and forgetting their defeats. The Anglo-Spanish War ended in 1604, with no side making a substantial victory. The peace treaty signed stated that they would return to a state they were before the war. It puts into perspective just what we choose to celebrate. We highlight the small victories in wars that we ultimately don't make a gain from. The 1588 Spanish Armada was but one victory in a war that spanned decades and economically damaged both countries. This ambitious campaign, its defeat, and how it was ultimately forgotten by history best illustrates how fickle our national mindset can be.